Good morning. My name is Bruce Williams. I am the president of C.L. Davis Foundation and also the senior veterinary pathologist at the Department of Veterinary Pathology at the AFIP. And uh, this morning I will have the pleasure of talking to you about diseases of what I call the irrelevant rodents or the forgotten rodents and that is the guinea pig, the hamster, and the gerbil. But before I do that I always like to start these uh, these little video sessions off with thanking somebody. And the people I would like to thank certainly don't have enough time to remember all of them, but they would be the staff and the residents of the AFIP, the Department of Veterinary Pathology, who have been there in the almost 25 years since I've been in the department. Uh, obviously, it takes a tremendous amount of time and working with other people to put together these type of lectures and to amass the material and the knowledge that allows me to stand here for hours in front of the camera and talk about pathology of various species. And the staff of the AFIP have been wonderful in sharing their ideas and thoughts and material and the residents have been wonderful in challenging me for the last 25 years to, uh, uh, to always be on top of my game because one time that you slip, these young bright men and women are always going to catch you. So I have to thank them for the time and the indulgence that they've shown me in allowing me to do the work that I've been able to do for veterinary pathology. With that, let's go ahead and go to the first slide and talk a little bit about guinea pigs, hamsters, and gerbils. Photographic credits are always extremely important and, and obviously uh, I have called from a number of, of good friends and a number of sources, only a few of who are, uh, uh, are noted here, but I certainly want to recognize a couple of people. Dr. Dean Percy, who is a good friend and an author of Percy and Barthold's Pathology of Laboratory Rabbits and Rodents, now in its third edition, an excellent volume, and you will see a number of the images in this lecture come from that book. Uh, Dr. Mike Eckhaus has been a, a uh, staff pathologist at the National Institutes of Health for many years and has contributed uh, very well to the lecture that I will give today. I think we'll go ahead and start on guinea pigs. And I call these the irrelevant rodents because the heyday of their use in animal research is probably over with the advent of uh, transgenic animals, especially mice, which can be tailor-made for almost any research need. Uh, the need for these more specialized species in all but a few pursuits is, is greatly decreased in years. But we also talk about them from a pet point of view. Uh, guinea pigs are one of my favorite pets, and if I ever get another one or another pet, it probably is going to be a guinea pig. So. The majority of guinea pigs that are used in research are white guinea pigs, but as opposed to, uh, to rabbits, these are not albino guinea pigs. Uh, these strains are what is known as acromelanic, which means that you do see melanin. You can see the, it on their ears here. Their eyes are not pink, but they are brown, and you can see some on their feet. So they are pigmented. We do not see in them a lot of the congenital defects that we see in true uh, albinistic animals, which have not only defective migration of melanocytes from the neural crest to their final resting place around the body, but also have a constellation of other congenital defects, not shared by the laboratory guinea pig. A little bit about the anatomy. Uh, female guinea pigs have two large paired conical nipples. Okay. As opposed to other laboratory species, they do not have large litters, generally one or two, uh, two, of the, two offspring are the rule. So you don't need uh, a full set of six or eight nipples if you're only going to give birth to one or two babies. The first time you do a post on a male guinea pig, it can be a little confusing because you look in and you see these this large paired tubular organ. And this is actually a male guinea pig. Male guinea pigs have extremely large seminal vesicles, which can sort of resemble a uterus, 
to the uh, poorly initiated. And then they also have a wide range of other uh, uh, secondary uh, sexual glands, bobo urethral glands as well, prostate, etc. But the, the large seminal vesicles is uh, very characteristic and striking in the male guinea pig. Male guinea pig also has two keratinous styles on the, uh, the gland's penis. And I don't truly know what the, uh, what the use of them is, but uh, obviously everything evolves over thousands and thousands of years, so they must serve some purpose. We're looking at the vulva of the sow or the female guinea pig, and like other hystricomorph animals, the female guinea pig has a vaginal closure membrane. It's a very dense mucoid plug. And the only time the cervix is actually open is at estrus and at parturition, and the rest of the time it is plugged closed. A couple of interesting uh, microscopic things that you might note in the guinea pig. We're looking at the lung and the arteries of the, or the branches of pulmonary artery have very marked hyperplasia. And I probably shouldn't call it hyperplasia because it's a normal finding. And the first time you look at the lungs of, of guinea pigs, you, you want to think that the animal has pulmonary hypertension. That's what we would think of as any other species, but this is normal in the, uh, in the guinea pig. Guinea pigs also have a lot of perivascular lymphoid tissue as opposed to other species in which the lymphoid tissue is primarily bronchiolar associated or airway associated. In the, uh, in the guinea pig, it tends to be uh, associated with blood vessels. This is an incidental finding. It is normal. It tends to increase with age, and you see it in higher prevalence in subpleural areas. But don't construe this as a problem or that the animal is in a dirty environment because it's just normal for guinea pigs. Okay, we are looking at a pregnant sow. And the pregnancy, what goes on and, and the, the care is very different in guinea pigs than most other rodents. First of all, uh, sows can more than double their weight during pregnancy. So you have to feed them accordingly. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about pregnancy toxemia and guinea pigs. But they can get very large. And the infants are huge and they're precocious, which means essentially when they're born, the mother gives them a little bit of angiogenital stimulation and then they're off and running. And guinea pig sows are incredibly poor mothers. They feed the baby maybe once a day, if that. They give it almost no attention. Okay, so. But another problem with having such a large offspring is that the guinea pigs generally are growing when they're pregnant for the first time. And there is, there's a problem, a real problem, with dystocia in guinea pigs. Now, guinea pigs need to be bred before about seven months. They come into their first estrus at three to four months and they're growing. Now, if they're not bred during that time, the pelvic bones will actually fuse together. And this predisposes them to having uh, uh, dystocia. Because normally during the parturition process, uh, there is a, a release of a hormone called relaxin, which causes a uh, relaxation of the iliosacral ligaments and dissolves the cartilage which fuses the os pelvis together and this allows the pelvis to distend and the bones to separate enough to allow the very large uh, guinea pig baby to come out. So if the animal is not bred before seven months then that pelvis just ossifies and no amount of relaxin can, uh, can result in distension so the animals will get uh, dystocia. Now the, there is a certain cell which you may have heard about which is in 
high levels in the blood of pregnant guinea pigs, but always uh, in guinea pigs are in is in certain uh, certain amounts. Usually more, more uh, uh, in higher numbers in females due to the presence of estrogen, but you can see it in males as well. And you can see them in the circulating blood. It can be up to uh, three to four percent of the normal white blood cell population. And these are lymphocytes, and they're known as Kurloff cells or Kurloff body cells. And we're looking at, at one right here, and you can see on the left-hand side of this cell, you can see the nucleus on the right, left-hand side, is a single uh, glycoprotein-containing secretory granule, which stains very brightly uh, red on periotic acid shift, or PAS stains. And there's been a lot of conjecture as to what these cells actually do. And the best we know, it may serve some type of immune modulating or anti-cancer function. Um, they're seen in the most increased numbers. The highest concentration is seen in the placenta of the gravid sow and the spleen. And if you take a female uh, guinea pig and inject it with estrogen, it causes a rise in the numbers. As I said before, the function of these cells isn't really known, but current thought is that they are sort of a counterpart of NK cells in other species. These cells have a demonstrated cytotoxic effect on guinea pig leukemia cells in vitro. And when you have a, when you inject those same leukemia cells into guinea pigs in vivo, you see an increase in Kurloff cells. And guinea pigs do not have a, a large amount of cancer as opposed to many other species. So it's thought that these cells might be a constant monitoring and an elimination for certain types of cancer. So these are Kurloff body cells. And this is the spleen of a uh, female guinea pig that's been injected with estrogen. This is a PAS stain. And you can see the numbers of these Kurloff cells because the the glycoprotein granule in the cytoplasm stains brightly pink on PAS stain. Okay, let's look a little bit at the, uh, the diseases of guinea pigs. And, and this first slide we're going to look at, we're going to start in the uh, uh, respiratory system, cardiorespiratory system, and we are looking at a severe necrotizing bronchopneumonia. You can see that there is marked collapse and hemorrhage of the craniovental lobe. So this is a bronchopneumonia. And this is the one of the most important or possibly the most important pathogen of guinea pigs today. And this is Bordetella bronchoseptica. And it causes a bronchopneumonia because it is one of those organisms that want nothing more than to be ciliary, ciliated epithelium. And it lives in organs where you see ciliated epithelium. Of course, the lower airways is one, the middle ear, and in the uterus. These are all places where we can see Bordetella infection, and they also all are organs which have cilia. Um, when we talk about the diseases of guinea pigs, hamsters, and gerbils. The vast majority of these diseases affect the young or pregnant animals. And I will tell you when there are exceptions, but this, like, like uh, uh, most other conditions in this species, affects pregnant animals and, uh, and young animals. During epizootics, pregnant sows may die, they may abort, they may produce stillborns. And this is a common problem associated with pet guinea pigs because they may come in contact with other animal species which carry Bordetella like dogs and cats. And this is a common problem. Death of guinea pigs is a common problem from pet shops. Okay? Because what will happen at Easter time, a lot of pet shops will, will take the rabbits that they have and the guinea pigs and they'll put them together in the front window of the pet shop and they, they behave very nicely together and they're very cute. And the problem is that 
Rabbits are notorious carriers of Bordetella, so you buy your guinea pig and you take it home and two weeks later, it's dead of full pneumonia. So if you come across that situation, buy the rabbit. Don't buy the guinea pig. Uh, but in laboratory facilities, uh, it's commonly because it can be, uh, it can be carried in an inapparent carrier state. About 20% of animals in facilities may have uh, uh, may have may carry Bordetella without clinical signs and it is best recovered from the upper respiratory tract or the tympanic bulla. There are a number of differentials here. Um, guinea pigs can get other viruses of other laboratory animals, Sendai virus, pneumonia virus of mice, uh, and there are a number of bacterial agents which can cause a similar picture including staphylococcus, strep, which we're going to talk about imminently, uh, and Klebsiella, which can be a real problem in laboratory animal colonies. But Bordetella bronchoseptica, when you see a really bad case of, uh, uh, of pneumonia, that's the first thing that I want you to think about. And the pneumonia actually will have a appearance that looks very much like what I consider shipping fever of cattle. This may be the shipping fever of, uh, of guinea pigs because microscopically you will see influx of tremendous numbers of neutrophils, fibrin, and you will have degenerate cells filling these alveoli which look like oat cells. And the oat cells are the cells that uh, uh, we see in shipping fever. They are degenerate epithelial cells or neutrophils. and They have very characteristic morphologic appearance. They only appear in very severe infections. And of course, Bordetella bronchoseptica is the most severe respiratory infection of guinea pigs. Moving on, we're gonna look at a disease that is a little more historic. We don't see it that much anymore in guinea pigs, but you can see it in guinea pigs, you can see it in primates, and you can see it in man. And what I want you to take a look at, we're looking at the heart and lugs of this, of this guinea pig. And it is sort of like a big ball of organ because they're all stuck together with abundant fibrin. And if we do a cross section on this particular condition, this is a separate animal. What we're looking at is a cross section through both lungs and the heart. The heart is on the right and we can see there is one lung which is very dark red and collapsed. Uh, dorsally and ventrally, this lung is somewhat expanded, is very whitish, and is also consolidated. And surrounding all of these organs is an extremely thick layer of fibrin. This can show you just how bad the fibrin deposition can get in affected animals. And this is, whenever you see in any species, whenever you see tremendous amounts of fibrin, the one bacterial organism I want you to think about is Streptococcus. And Streptococcus causes lots of fibrin deposition. In pigs, when we see fibrin in the chest, in the cranial vault, we think about strep suis. In opossums, we see strep in the chest, we think about strep viridans. When you see it in the guinea pig, I want you to think about Streptococcus pneumoniae. It used to be called Diplococcus due to its characteristic staining qualities on gram stains. But Streptococcus pneumoniae is more of a historical. It's been cleaned out of most colonies today. And it's an infection that's triggered by environmental changes when you would have a decrease in the temperature of your colony or an increase in temperature, you would get uh, outbreaks with very high mortality. Let's go ahead and continue with uh, one of the most famous diseases of guinea pigs, and that is vitamin C deficiency or scurvy. When I was in practice back in the uh, early 80s, we used to joke that this was the only disease that uh, the guinea pigs had. But guinea pigs are a, uh, they're a, in a group of small numbers of species of animals that lack a particular enzyme called l gulonolactone which uh, is required to synthesize uh, vitamin C or ascorbic acid from glucose. And other 
animal species that also require added vitamin C to their diet and can't manufacture it themselves would include humans, non-human primates, fish, certain types of birds, um, and guinea pigs require about five milligrams a day of vitamin C. And requirements are, are highest, as you would imagine, growing animals and pregnant sows. And it's not uncommon for uh, guinea pigs to be fed a diet that is borderline deficient in vitamin C because vitamin C is one of the first vitamins that will disappear in feed that's stored longer than 90 days. And if it's stored at a higher than normal ambient temperature, it will disappear even faster. Now, the importance of vitamin C is important for a wide number of reasons. But the most obvious uh, uh, use of vitamin C is as a cofactor for lysyl and proline hydroxylase. And these enzymes are important in the cross-linking of type 1 and type 4 collagen. Type 1 collagen being in bone and tendon, type 4 being in basement membranes. And as we look at th this image, we're looking at the, uh, the stifle joints of a guinea pig. And what you see is hemorrhage around the joints. And if we were able to show the whole guinea pig, we would see hemorrhages throughout the body. We would see loose teeth with hemorrhage around them. Uh, animals with early stages of vitamin C deficiency uh, are painful. They are reluctant to move. And because of the decreased uh, cross-linking in the basement membranes of vessels, they tend to uh, uh, they tend to have hemorrhages throughout uh, joints and uh, etc. Um, the problem with uh, the type one collagen deficient cross-linking is that it creates problems, especially in the growing animal. Type 1 collagen deficiency results in the creation of a defective osteoid, and that's part of the normal elongation of the growth plate. An osteoid has to be laid down on the, the primary spongiosa, be mineralized, and then remodeled by osteoclasts. If there's any problem with that, then you end up with very thin spongiosa and microfractures and hemorrhage, and that's what happens here because the osteoid that is put down on the cartilaginous spicules coming out of the growth plate is abnormal and cannot be mineralized. Even if the animal has sufficient mineral, it is not going to happen. So the, the lesions are most severe in growing animals. And if we take a look here, you can see that there is a mild bowing out of the periosteum at the level of the growth plate. The cartilaginous cores are very short. They are often broken. There's fiber and hemorrhage, and the animals walk with extreme pain. There are a number, a number of other problems associated with vitamin C deficiency. We tend to think primarily of the bone and joint problems, but you also have significant deficiencies with uh, tooth formation, uh, you have odontoblastic defects, there is uh, decreased uh, neutrophil migration, so these animals also have uh, significant problems with bacterial infection, so it's a, it's a wide-ranging problem systemically for the animal. One of the uh, lesions, the gross lesions that uh, is well known, is the lesion that appears on the, uh, at the costochondral junction on the ribs, as we see here. Here, obviously, we can see the hemorrhage associated with, uh, with the vascular fragility in this area. But at the costochondral junction, that bone is bowed out. And we talked about problems with mineralization of the growth plate and remodeling. So it's an unstable. The, the trabeculi are small. They are fractured. There's hemorrhage, and that's a very unstable joint there at the costochondral junction. And so what the body does is it puts down mineral <coughs> and excessive fibrous connective tissue uh, right there at that unstable joint. And you, it's a mushrooming 
of the physes and mushrooming of the uh, costochondral junction here. And that is known as the scorbutic lattice. There's a very similar thing that you might see in rickets called the rickettic rosary, but the scorbutic lattice is a common finding at the rib cage of the costochondral junction in animals with long standing scurvy. Now, this is a well loved guinea pig. You can tell that it's well loved because it's pretty fat. There's a good chance it might live in in an elementary school classroom and everybody loves this guinea pig. Unfortunately, they love it, but they really don't know how to take care of it. And we're looking at the hind feet, the hind feet, the hind feet of a pregnant, excuse me, does not to be pregnant, a, a fat guinea pig. It's an obese guinea pig, and it probably is living in not great sanitation. Guinea pigs are fairly regular and indiscriminate urinators and defecators, and they tend to drink a lot, they put out a lot of urine, and their litter generally needs to be changed once a day. Oftentimes, people don't have the ability or the intention to do that, so they are often sitting in damp litter. And if the animal is obese and there's a hard floor underneath that litter, you're going to have trauma to the, uh, to the hind feet. And this leads to a bacterial infection which is called ulcerative pododermatitis and it's also known as Bigfoot. I hear a lot of people call this Bumblefoot and Bumblefoot is a condition that is seen in birds. It is Bigfoot in uh, guinea pigs. The difference is really all, not all that much and what happens is you have guinea pigs uh, that are obese they have poor sanitation. It's often associated with wire or slatted cages. And they're on these feet and the feet become, the skin of the feet become wet and macerated and you have inoculation of usually staph into these wounds. And we're looking at the hind feet and you see that you have ulcers on, on both of these feet. The pads and the underlying tissue is greatly swollen. You can also tell a little bit about the uh, husbandry of this particular animal by the length of the toenails, which really need a clipping. But you can see that these are ulcers, and it's not an abscess. This isn't Staph aureus abscessation where you can drain it. What happens is this is very vascular connective tissue, and it is highly refractory to treatment. It requires uh, dressing wound dressing, application of ointments, redressing on a daily basis. You can't go out and you can't go and do surgery on this and cut the tissue out, the infected tissue, because it's granulation tissue and it just bleeds all over the place and, and the bleeding can actually actually be life threatening. So it is a real problem in treating. It usually takes months, if not longer, to treat. Uh, Severe cases may be associated with amyloidosis, which is a problem with chronic inflammation we'll see in a number of rodent species. Okay, uh, there are other places where you can see staph infection in guinea pigs, pneumonia, we talked about it as a differential for bordetellosis. Rarely you can see staph mastitis and or conjunctivitis in guinea pigs. So this is Bigfoot and associated usually with poor sanitation and hard cage bottoms. Well, this guinea pig has a very panicky look on his face. Uh, and you can see the excoriation, the hair loss around the face. And this is uh, a case of uh, acariasis in guinea pigs. Trixocaris cavii is the sarcoptic mite of the guinea pig and it causes lesions that uh, are hyperkeratotic, encrusting, and extremely pyritic. Uh, it is one of those mites that actually can cause uh, hematologic signs with eosinophilia and lymphocytosis. And sometimes the pruritus gets so bad in these animals that they can seizure or they'll just jump up out of you know, a very quiet state and run headlong into the wall because of the intense pruritus. 
Uh, there are a number of other mites that you can see which don't cause this kind of problem. Demodex cavii, Myocopes mesculinus, Notoedris murus. These are all mites that seem to be, you know, go between mice and rats and hamsters and guinea pigs, which are housed in, in close association. But uh, Trixocaris cavii is the bad actor of the group and the one that can cause uh, real problems. Pediculosis or lice infection is not a severe problem in guinea pigs uh, and usually has no clinical signs. Uh, the louse infestation or infection of this guinea pig became obvious only after the animal had died. It had been put on the uh, necropsy table and as the animal's body cooled down, the necropsy lights and ultimately the lights of the uh, photographic table warmed the hair and, and the lice just came up off the body surface to the tips of the hair where the infection became apparent. Uh, there are two types of uh, lice that you commonly see in guinea pigs. On the left is Glyricola porcelli. On the right is Gyropus ovalis. They are large biting lice that you will see guinea pigs from time to time, but really not a, a major problem. Here's a guinea pig with a well-circumscribed area of alopecia and hyperkeratosis on its face. Ringworm is a problem in some colonies of guinea pigs, uh, although most animals are in infected colonies are asymptomatic. Once again, pregnant sows, weanlings are most commonly affected you can see outbreaks after environmental changes such as the onset of winter and sometimes the uh, the infections get extremely bad you can see secondary bacterial infections you can hardly even tell that this is a guinea pig because of the uh, excoriations and the secondary bacterial infection that's associated with this case of dermatophytosis Histologically, the lesions associated with dermatophytosis in the guinea pig are very similar than to what we see in other species. Here we see the arthrospores of the common type of ringworm, trichophyton uh, menagraphytes, uh, which we see in, in uh, guinea pigs. And it infiltrates the keratin layer of the developing hair shaft. So, ringworm. Now, hair loss is an extremely common problem in guinea pigs. Telogen effluvium can occur in a number of conditions and is most commonly associated with pregnancy and following lactation, where the body is trying to you know, help these very large offsprings develop and so the energy that is used to, you know, during gestation has to come from somewhere. The body shuts down uh, anabolic systems such as the development of hair during fetal growth. Eventually, when the, uh, the offspring are born and the, the animal is no longer lactating, the hair will grow back. There are a number of other possibilities for alopecia. We've talked about uh, dermatophytosis. Barbering is seen in guinea pig colonies, but is much less common than uh, uh, what you will see it with mice and rats. But occasionally, uh, in group housing situations, you will see animals that are barbered. Um, and another condition that is very common in females is cystic reedy ovarii. And we'll look at that in a minute. And that's been associated with hair loss. And, and uh, because of the very common nature of this finding in older females, it probably gets a bad reputation. So. But anything that uh, diverts energy away from the normal anabolism of the hair follicle will result in telogen effluvium in this species and generalized hair loss. I apologize for the picture. Um, the pictures are not good, but this is a 
skin tumor uh, with a central pore in guinea pigs. And whereas all species pretty much have all of the different range of, uh, of skin tumors, many species have particularly one or two. And guinea pigs, the number one skin tumor, very common skin tumor in a guinea pig is the trichofolliculoma. The trichofolliculoma is a neoplasm. This is the cut section, which is a benign skin tumor. It is of follicular origin, and it differentiates within the tumor to all three segments of the hair follicle. And it often contains a central pore, which many of these sort of preemptive follicular structures will empty into. Okay, we're looking, of course, the hind end of a female guinea pig, and, and this is a, another problem that's associated with poor sanitation, and it's a simple case of urine scald. And whenever you see urine scald in pet rodents or lagomorphs, it's associated with poor sanitation. Somebody's not changing the litter enough, and the animals are sitting in chronic wet litter. And especially as the animals get older and they get excessive skin folds around the perineum, it worsens the problem. Uh, older animals that are obese can also have these skin folds, which uh, inhibit urination or defecation, so the animal is often urinating or defecating on itself and gets a secondary bacterial infection. This is a young guinea pig, young guinea pig probably less than about eight weeks of age. And you can see that it has a very reddened, somewhat bulging eye. There is a mucopurulent discharge from the uh, uh, from the, the conjunctiva. This is a condition which is caused by Chlamydophila cytosci, known as guinea pig inclusion conjunctivitis. It's a self-limiting disease uh, which is often latent within a colony. And the, the sows uh, carry the Chlamydophila within the reproductive tract, and as the young pigs are delivered, they are inoculated. And usually the only manifestation of chlamydophilosis in these young four to eight week old guinea pigs is a severe conjunctivitis. Eventually uh, the animal will overcome the infection and you won't see any more evidence of disease until the next time uh, there is a round of birthings. Occasionally, you'll see other syndromes in colonies which are affected with Chlamydophila. Uh, you can see a uh, Chlamydophila pneumonia, which is often complicated by bordentellosis or strep, or you can see abortions. It's probably pretty widespread in conventional colonies. Um, most older guinea pigs have seroconverted, uh, not a difficult diagnosis when you have conjunctivitis in most of your young guinea pigs, a, uh, uh, a swab of the conjunctiva will often result in positive immunofluorescence for chlamydophila or chlamydia cytosine. This is a, a incidental finding in guinea pigs, and it is known in the pet trade as PI, P-E-A-E-Y-E, and essentially, it is just a little bit of swelling of the uh, lacrimal gland or local fatty tissue underneath the third eyelid or elsewhere uh, in the conjunctiva. And unless it causes a problem, unless it causes uh, uh, some erosion to the cornea, most of the time is uh, just left alone. And, and animals with this defect are probably not prime choices to breed. But uh, if it causes a problem, obviously a little bit of surgery to remove that uh, bit of the third eyelid of the conjunctiva would be in order. So this is PI. Well, you've heard of the lethal white syndrome of horses, especially those affecting the offspring of Appaloosas. Um, and this is the lethal white syndrome of guinea pigs. 
One of the things that I tell people over and over when you have true albinos, and you can see the albinism of this animal, okay, you have a constellation of other congenital defects. Congenital defects rarely happen by themselves. They usually happen in groups, and this is a great example of that postulate. On the right-hand side, we have a roan guinea pig. Some people call them Dalmatians, but it's a, it's a very nice coloration with red and black on a white background. Well, when you breed the roans or the Dalmatians to each other, about 25% of the offspring are going to be homozygous for the roan allele. And this essentially results in a constellation of birth defects, including albinism, microphthalmia with associated ocular abnormalities. This animal has both microphthalmia and bilateral severe mature cataracts. It's also deaf. It has malocclusion due to abnormalities in jaw structure. It has malabsorption and on top of everything it has a poor immune system. These animals generally uh, are blind and deaf. They live up to eight to ten months. Supposedly they're sweet and they make wonderful pets, but uh, you know it's something that probably should be uh, uh, bred out of the pet guinea pig population. Obviously people who breed roan guinea pigs know about this condition. Well here's a little guinea pig that's laying on the floor with a head tilt, okay, or a little bit of opisthotness. And, and this animal has otitis media. We've talked about a number of conditions that can result in otitis media in guinea pigs. Bordetella is one. Remember, the uh, middle ear has uh, cilia, as do, does the inner ear. And Bordetella prefers to colonize places that, where the epithelial cells are ciliated. You could also find strep pneumoniae. Strepsoepidemicus, we talked about with cervical lymphadenitis, and pseudomonas. Uh, if you are doing colony necropsies of guinea pigs and you are not cracking the tympanic bulla to culture from for a colony necropsy, you're probably doing a disservice to the colony. Not so much in pet pets, but you know, it's a great place to culture all these bacteria from, especially Bordetella and Streptococcus pneumoniae. So just remember, colony necropsies, you have certain tests that you do on a regular basis, and one of those is to culture from the, uh, from the tympanic bulla. And this is uh, a normal uh, tympanic bulla from a guinea pig, and this is an animal with uh, otitis media, and you can see the marked cloudiness uh, and opaqueness of those tympanic bulla, which are fill, filled with organisms and likely suppurative or chronic inspissated suppurative exudate. We're in the GI tract. This is a female guinea pig. We do have uterus. Notice how it looks different than those seminal vesicles I showed you earlier. And if you look at the ovary in the top right-hand corner of this slide, you will see that uh, it is enlarged and there are multiple cysts. And this is a condition known as either ovarian cysts or cystic radioovarii. And the radioovarii is uh, the ciliated epithelial cell which forms essentially the epithelial lined core of the ovary. And over time, as the sow ages after several pregnancies, you will see expansion of the uh, uh, rate ovarii, which ultimately will compress and efface the functional ovarian tissue. And cysts may actually communicate with the exterior of the ovary, as we see here. And this has been associated with reduced reproductive performance, as, as you can imagine, in older sows. And, has been linked to a wide variety of other reproductive problems, including hydrometra or pyometra or, or alopecia. As we said before, this is extremely, extremely common in these older animals. And I think that a lot of those uh, connections are circumstantial in nature 
and probably have little, uh, little basis in reality. Very nice picture from Dean Percy of the uterus, and you could see marked uh, necrosis and hemorrhage, and there is a suppurative bacterial endometritis caused by Bordetella. Remember the fimbria of the uh, ovary, the fallopian tube is ciliated, has ciliary epithelium, and it is a great place for Bordetella to gain a foothold during systemic infections and one of the main causes of endometritis uh, in the guinea pig is Bordetella bronchoseptica. A massively dilated uterus. This could be uh, a, a combination, it could be Bordetellosis. This one happens to be Mucometra. Remember that uh, the cervix in the guinea pig is usually closed except at estrus and at parturition. And uh, as we said before, cystic radio varii have been causally identified with a number of conditions, but not definitively proven. We are looking at the kidneys of a guinea pig. And you can see that the kidneys are shrunken. They are pitted. They have a very un, a very convoluted surface. And one thing that uh, is important to remember about all of the species of laboratory rodents and lagomorphs is they all have a pretty profound chronic interstitial nephritis. And all of them are a little different. Uh, in the guinea pig, it is referred to as segmental nephrosclerosis, although I think this is total nephrosclerosis here. And there is primarily a segmental to diffuse interstitial fibrosis with tubular degeneration. There is sparing of the glomeruli, although some reports have identified uh, excessive levels of IgG and complement in, in glomeruli. But uh, in guinea pigs, it primarily spares the glomeruli. The cause of this is this subject of great congestion. Some people consider it a, a generalized vascular disturbance. Uh, high protein diets have been incriminated, herpes virus infections. The bottom line is we really don't know what causes this in most rodent species. So I just, it's difficult for me to keep them all straight. I just try to remember that uh, in, they all have it, and in guinea pigs you generally see minimal glomerular change. And just another picture, cross-section, okay, dilated glomeruli and tubules. The predominant finding is fibrosis within the interstitium. If you look at enough pictures of kidneys in any species, eventually you will find polycystic kidney disease. To my knowledge, no one has done a lot of research in this. This is what I call a one-off. You're just going to see it every once in a while, and, and it's no big deal. Not a great picture, but uh, cystic calculi, or bladder urolis, are a very common finding as a result of chronic bacterial urinary tract infections, especially E. coli in older sows. And older sows have you know, they have a number of things which predispose them, including excessive perineal uh, tissue, which traps urine. They're often in less than adequate sanitary conditions. So bacterial urinary tract infections in this species go hand in hand with the formation of, uh, of uroliths. Struvite is the most common type of, of urinary tract infection. And Finally, the last uh, picture on guinea pigs, and these are stillborn uh, pups. Dystocia, as we said before, is a very common problem. And when you have dystocia, you often have marked anasarca, and so these animals were, were not delivered. They were delivered at term, but they were stillborn, probably because the uh, the sow was not bred early enough 
uh, in lifespan. Remember, we have to breathe before seven months of age or you will get fusion of the pelvic bones and uh, will get a lot of dystocias. Okay, so that covers guinea pigs. And I have less to talk about with hamsters and even less to talk about with gerbils. But I do want to talk a little bit about hamsters. Uh, obviously, this, uh, this particular photo has been photoshopped. It's a very cute picture and not really representative, in my opinion, of the hamster's personality. Of the three species that we will talk about today, uh, I feel strongest that hamsters make poor pets, especially for children. Hamsters, as a general rule, as opposed to gerbils and guinea pigs, tend to be nocturnal and they do bite quite a bit more. A lot of people recommend picking them up by allowing them to crawl into a can and picking them up. And I feel that if you have a pet that you have to have crawl into a can so you can pick it up so it won't bite you, it's probably not the best type of pet to have. I know there are some wonderful hamsters out there, but uh, I'm not a big fan of the pet hamster. I have been on the receiving end of enough bites. Um, now there's some very interesting things about the hamsters you might not already know. Uh, most, and this is, this is your prototypical hamster, which is seen in the pet trade or in the laboratory, and this is the golden hamster. And uh, there are all sorts of different hamsters now, and you have teddy bear hamsters, which are long-haired versions. And, and, uh, but the vast majority of the golden hamsters or derived uh, golden hamsters today originated from a single litter that was captured in Syria back in 1930. They're also known as Syrian hamsters. And because all of them come from this one litter, there's been extensive inbreeding, and these animals have a very low number of major histocompatibility genes, which allows any hamster to receive a tissue transplant from another. But on the other side, they have weakened immune systems, they're markedly susceptible to viral infections. But this low number of, uh, uh, of major histocompatibility genes made them a, a major species for research of tumors before the development of the, uh, the nude mouse. Now there are two types of, uh, of hamsters uh, which are used in the laboratory today. If you look at the picture on the bottom right, you'll see the normal Syrian hamster. And below it, and the picture at the top left, is a much smaller species of hamster with a black line down the middle, a little, a little racing stripe. And that's the Chinese hamster. And I don't know that much about hamsters or Chinese hamsters. I know that the Syrian hamster, the golden hamster, has 22 chromosome pairs and the Chinese have 11 chromosome pairs. So uh, because the Chinese hamster is so much smaller, I figure the, the larger an animal you are, the more chromosomes you have, or something like that. Ah, the, the cheek pouches, and cheek pouches are interesting. Hamsters have very well-developed cheek pouches, which they use to store food, um, not for long periods of time, but, but as they're collecting seeds, they can put it in there and go back to their their den or burrow and, and empty it out and, and go get more. And the cheek pouches are good and bad things. Okay, for, well, you talked about the hamster being used extensively in tumor research early on. Well, these cheek pouches, and if you take a look at this picture, you can see actually how big that cheek pouch is. But uh, it is also an immunologically privileged site. Okay, so if you have an immunologically privileged site in an animal which has low numbers of MHC2 genes, this was a great place where people would do xenotransplanted tumor work. So you could take tumors in the old days from other animals or from humans or whatever, and you could implant them in the cheek pouch of the hamster. And the body wouldn't recognize that the tumor was there. And until we developed nude mice and transgenic mice, hamsters were used extensively in uh, 
uh, in cancer research. But now we have nude mice and they have, you know, basically a, a very poorly functioning to non-existent immune system. It is much easier to use that. Another problem with the, uh, the cheek patches of hamsters is if you are doing research in which the animals have to be fasted uh, for a number of hours before they are sacrificed, the cheek patch of a hamster is usually full of food. And so just taking it out of its cage is not enough. So if you were working on a protocol and you had to sac uh, fast the animals, you would have to go, you would have to not only take them out of their cage, and they do tend to store food in larder. So you have to move them to a new cage, and then you would have to anesthetize them. You would have to evert these cheek pouches and make sure there was no food in there. So it, you know, it's just not a very workable system. But those are the cheek pouches. There are a couple of other anatomic things of note. Uh, hamsters have, or the male hamsters have paired sebaceous glands. They've known as the dorsal marking gland. Okay, and they consist of sebaceous glands and some hair follicles and pigment cells. It's not just for marking. Uh, in male hamsters, these glands appear to play some role in the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So we'll look at gerbils. Just remember in hamsters, they're on the dorsal surface. If you see a skin biopsy from that, it's not something that's abnormal or skin tumor. In gerbils, they're on the ventral surface. So these little rodents have things. Okay, we're looking at two weanlings. Everything I said about weanlings and pregnant animals being much more susceptible to, uh, to disease is also appropriate in hamsters and gerbils as well. We're looking at two weanling hamsters, and you can see that they're somewhat thin and they have a lot of fecal staining, watery feces smeared on their underside. And there is a term that has been used in hamsters for a long time to describe a complex of diseases which cause diarrhea, and that term is wet tail. It's an abused term because there are a number of bacterial and or viral agents, even some protozoal agents, which are able to cause diarrhea in uh, weanling hamsters. So don't like the term wet tail. And let's look at a couple of these conditions. We are looking at a hamster which is opened up with a markedly distended ilium and a dilated cecum. And the classic cause of wet tail in hamsters is a bacteria that's had a number of names over the last 30 years but the current name that it's known by is Lawsonia intracellularis. And this results in epizootics in young animals, usually weanlings. The animals will develop resistance to it in about 10 to 12 weeks. So if they're not infected young, it probably won't infect them. You can occasionally see spontaneous diseases following severe environmental changes, onset of winter, changes in temperature, stress, etc. But in infected animals or infected colonies during one of these outbreaks, you can see a morbidity of about 60 percent and mortality is very high, 90 to 100 percent is to be expected. And Lawsonia is an organism that has been noted in a number of species, all causing very similar lesions, usually in the ilium occasionally in the colon. But the vast majority of animal species that are affected are in the ilium. Hamsters and swine uh, are the ones that it is by far the best known and best documented in, but Lawsonia has been seen in a wide range of species, including rabbits and horses and the more species, and even some species of birds. In all these species, it tends to be a 
disease of the terminal small intestine, the ileum, except in the ferret. In ferret, it causes similar changes in the colon. And the changes that it causes is a marked hyperplasia of immature enterocytes. You have almost no goblet cells, as you can see on the right. Okay. And the crypts become very torturous, elongated, and the mucosa is thrown into these glandular folds. And pigs, one of the terms that has been used to describe this disease is intestinal adenomatosis. There's often a profound inflammatory response, usually uh, lymphoplasmacytic, with a scattering of neutrophils and crypt abscesses. The organism is not difficult to identify. It occurs in these immature enterocytes in the apical cytoplasm in large numbers. And a silver stain, such as a Warthin Starry 4.0 or a Dieterle, will easily demonstrate these organisms. One of the uh, GI bacteria that has been extensively researched within the last 20 years is Helicobacter. Helicobacter is a cause of peptic ulcers in humans, and as a result, there has been a lot of research in identifying and developing animal models. And it seems that the more we look at various species, the more we are likely to find Helicobacter. Uh, and there are many different species of Helicobacter which are related. Uh, hamsters have the ability to be infected with Helicobacter pylori, which makes them a good model. And in infected animals, they develop an atrophic gastritis and intestinal metaplasia. And there are also a couple of other Helicobacter species that uh, have been identified in hamsters, including Helicobacter orati, and even a Helicobacter that lives in the gallbladders, which causes marked inflammation and fibrosis of the gallbladder wall. This one is known as Helicobacter cholecystis. And here we see uh, in a, the intestine of a a hamster infected with Helicobacter marked intestinal hyperplasia and metaplasia with profound lymphoplasmacytic and neutrophilic inflammation. Helicobacter, unlike uh, Lawsonia, is a extracellular parasite. And in the stomach, the Silver positive spiral bacteria like to live in the lumen. They live in the gastric mucus coat, but they do not infiltrate the, the, uh, the stomach epithelium, which makes them more difficult to treat. So that's one of the problems of treating Helicobacter in a number of species. But most species probably have Helicobacter, and they've been identified in everything from ferrets to cheetahs and, and mice and, and many other animal species. Here we have a hamster with marked gaseous distension and chronic mural thickening of the colon. And this is a case of chronic giardiasis. And giardiasis in hamsters, like most other species, is asymptomatic. But a certain number of individuals will show this chronic mural thickening, probably due to prolonged gastric distension. And eventually, these animals may develop a wasting disease or even amyloidosis, as and we'll see shortly, amyloid is a, a real problem in hamsters. So it is the organism is Giardia murus, uh, shared with mice and rats. So there are other similar appearing uh, organisms 
in the small intestine of hamsters, uh, spironu spironucleus murus, and hexamina murus are extremely common commensal parasites. And if you look in the intestinal tract of hamsters, you'll often see aggregates of these organisms down inside the crypts. They are unassociated with inflammation and probably normal commensal organisms. I mentioned this in guinea pigs, but now would be a very good time, and later on when I do lecture on rabbits, we will, we will talk about this again, but all of these laboratory rodents and lagomorphs are very susceptible to gastric dysbiosis following administration of penicillin and other antibiotics which have profound effect on gram-positive organisms. And those are ones that penicillin, and they usually end in either psyllin or mycin. So streptomycin, uh, erythromycin, neomycin, canamycin, these are all bad choices. And one dose can result in wiping out the normal bacterial flora. In, in the hamster, the most common bacteria are lactobacillus and bacteroides. And one or two doses of these antibiotics is enough to wipe out this and allow a million-fold increase in the level of Clostridium difficile. Now, Clostridium difficile itself doesn't cause a problem, but the toxin that it causes causes a severe necrotizing enteritis and tiflitis. And you can see marked necrosis and hemorrhage. And it's a very interesting pattern normally. And you can just, you can see that the toxin as it, as it diffuses into the mucosal lining, you'll see a progressive Necrosis with a very distinct line between the viable and the, the necrotic tissue. That line over time gets deeper and deeper into the mucosa. So this one has you know, a lot of hemorrhage right here. And there's a lot we don't know totally about this. This condition was, had a really bad name. It used to be called antibiotic toxicity. And the antibiotic's not toxic. It just causes you know, a profound change in the bacterial flora. And even non-treated animals in the room may develop fatal, you know, necrosis in the small intestine, the uh, cecum, and the colon. So this is a gas, uh, excuse me, intestinal dysbiosis as a result of elimination of gram-positive flora. One of the diseases that we see on a fairly regular basis in, in rodent species, whether laboratory or uh, wild, is another form of clostridium. This is Clostridium piliforme, also known as Tizer's disease. Once again, severe changes in the colony, environmental changes may in colonies in which tizers is endemic result in epizootics of tizers disease. And the spores associated with this clostridial bacterium are extremely long-lived and it may, may live in contaminated bedding for up to two years. And it doesn't take very long for the organism to uh, uh, to kill the animal. Death is usually in about six or eight days. And what happens is you have ingestion of the spore containing bacilli. And the, uh, the spores are liberated, causing ne necrotizing lesions in the cecum and the large intestine. When these lesions, or excuse me, when this, these bacilli at the edge of these lesions, get access to the portal circulation, they will move into the liver and cause lesions that look very much like what we see in the bottom right-hand corner. These are areas 
initially of bland necrosis due to the exotoxin liberated by the clostridial piliforme bacillus. Eventually, if the animal survives, then these will be replaced by uh, infiltrating neutrophils and histiocytes. And if you want to find the organism, they're easily demonstrated by a silver stain at the interface of the necrotic and normal tissue. Uh, usually at this point the animal expires, but you can have lesions in the heart as well. But the characteristic triad of lesions in the intestine, liver, and heart in most species should give you a high, uh, a high index of suspicion for Tizzer's disease. There is one species that gets Tizzer's disease in which you will not find the gastrointestinal lesions and that is the horse. Foals with Tizzer's disease only have liver and, and myocardial lesions if they have those. And Tizzer's disease has rarely been identified in humans. There's probably no zoonotic potential unless you are. We're looking at the colon of a hamster here and it has been opened up and we can see that there are a mass of small tapeworms in here or cestodes. This is a parasite that really doesn't cause much problem in the hamster. Uh, it used to be called Hymenolopus nana. It has been renamed. Please don't get me started about the parasitologists, but it is now called Rodentolepis nana. Life cycle is direct, uh, but it's an asymptomatic infection. doesn't cause any real problem in the hamster. Uh, there is a related tapeworm, which is known as Hymenolopus diminuta um, in man, and there is some zoonotic potential, but uh, that's a very uncommon infection. And this is what the uh, eggs look like on a fecal flotation or direct smear. Uh, this is just a sequela of uh, of any of the diseases that we have talked about for the last 20 minutes, which are all of the, the so-called wet tail uh, producers. So any of these that we've talked about from the bacterial agents to the antibiotic uh, related clostridia to, to the worms can cause diarrhea and so-called wet tail. But what we're looking at here is in the left of the slide, you can see telescoping of the uh, large intestine and a very long interception, which is now protruding uh, probably an inch or so outside of the anus. So if you ask to me what caused this, just pick one. Uh, nothing really important, but uh, if you are doing work with hamsters and looking at liver, there are some very non-specific inclusions that you'll see. If you look carefully, you can see some round eosinophilic intracytoplasmic inclusions in these hepatocytes, and those most likely uh, are lysosomes, representing some sort of very mild, uh, non-life-threatening cellular injury in this animal, and you can often see uh, pretty large intranuclear inclusions, which are simply nuclear membrane invagination. So you'll see a lot of little inclusions in, in hamster livers, and they are very rarely of any clinical significance. One problem that you can see in hamsters are multiple cysts and they generally affect a number of organs as we see here. There are hepatic cysts, cysts in the pancreas. You can see cysts around the accessory sex glands on the surface of the bladder. And if this was a male animal, you can often see them in the gonads, especially the epididymis. So multisystemic cystic disease. And the cause is unknown. It's thought that liver cysts may be the result of the intralobar and the uh, intralobular ducts to fuse, um, 
but it's a common incidental finding of no real clinical significance. Now this is a good finding, clinically significant, and a very good portrayal of the appearance of amyloidosis in the hamster liver, and you often get this very nice patterning of the liver. The liver will be large, the edges of the lobes will be rounded. Amyloidosis is commonly seen in older hamsters and is a pretty common cause of renal insufficiency and mortality, but you can see it in young animals as well as early as three or four months. In the, uh, in the kidney you have, and this is a picture in the liver where you have marked replacement of the uh, liver by this congophilic amyloid. In the kidneys it is primarily deposited initially in the glomerulus and as such you have a derangement of the polarity of the glomerular basement membrane and you have marked proteinuria. And when you have marked proteinuria you tend to have thrombosis throughout the body and in some colonies of hamsters which have a high incidence of this you will see uh, atrial thrombosis in up to 33 percent of animals. So you can also see changes in your coagulation profile as well. Uh, amyloid is probably not the only thing that causes this. You can't have large thrombi just with that. Generally you have some uh, level of cardiac insufficiency. Here's just another picture and I'm sorry I don't have better pictures of this but but you can see that the the, the left atrium is markedly distended by a large white thrombus. So this is atrial thrombosis and it's usually associated with amyloidosis. I know very little about Chinese hamsters. All I know is this and we are looking at the eyelets and Chinese hamsters uh, have a autosomal recessive syndrome of diabetes mellitus. And if you look at this islet, this is not the normal picture that you expect with diabetes mellitus in most animal species where you get uh, marked distension of islet cells and vacuolation with uh, abundant glycogen. If you take a look at this, the, uh, the islet cells now are involuting. They are undergoing apoptosis rather than accumulating glycogen. So it's a very specific uh, type of age-related age diabetes and uh, is, is one of the reasons that Chinese hamsters are used in medical research. Kidneys. Old rodents, bad kidneys. Uh, in the hamster, the condition is referred to as arteriolar nephrosclerosis, and it's very similar to histologically to uh, chronic, or chronic progressive nephropathy in rats. Of the, the forgotten rodents, I believe that this is the, the kidney that is most similar to what we see in the rat. And it is, a, once again, a common disease of more, uh, causing mortality in old hamsters may be associated with amyloidosis as well. Um, it is more prevalent in females than in males. Uh, and there is a lot of protein uh, with distinct glomerular changes. Remember the guinea pig did not have glomerular changes. Well, this one does have pretty distinct uh, glomerular changes. And, and one of the reasons it is called arteriolar nephrosclerosis is that you often see fibrinoid necrosis in renal vessels. So arterial nephrosclerosis, if you just remember old rodents, bad kidneys, that will serve you very well and you'll never be surprised. We're looking at para-ovarian cysts. Often they are very common in, in rodents. This one is not uh, a cystic radiovari Reet ovarii, like we see in the guinea pigs. These are external to the ovary, generally don't have a lot of impact on reproduction. So para-ovarian cysts. 
There's a condition which is of great import to people, has marked zoonotic potential, and a reason that people who are immunosuppressed or have had recent organ transplants should not have hamsters for pets. And this is a uh, arena virus disease, okay, and most, uh, most of the uh, infected hamsters are asymptomatic, okay. It is a, uh, it is a, a innocuous arena virus, which really doesn't cause too much damage, but causes marked proliferation in most hamsters of plasma cells. When you get a lot of plasma cells in the body, so we've seen a number of, of uh, conditions like this in various animal species, you develop tremendous amounts of uh, antigen antibody complexes. So these animals, if they become symptomatic, will probably die of glomerulonephritis. And just the, uh, just the uh, immuno for the parvoviral antigen in the, in the choroid plexus. A problem that you may see in your, uh, your research colony, but is more a, a research project, we don't see as much anymore, is uh, vitamin E deficiency during gestation in hamsters. Uh, this condition has been seen in third trimester fetuses and newborn hamsters, and it is a cavitating necrosis of the cerebrum, uh, which can be reproduced by feeding uh, pregnant hamsters a vitamin E deficient diet. Okay, usually there is marked cavitating necrosis, which begins as a vascular degeneration in the uh, subependable white matter and most of these affected pups are cannibalized so you often just may not see them born but you know it's a nice research thing very little clinical response okay the next condition is a condition that was tracked uh, by a researcher named Coggin back between 1975 and 1979 in a single facility. And occasionally you will still see it today. The virus is still out there. And it is a hamster-specific polyomavirus. Actually, Popova virus, but it's polyomavirus. Um, and it will cause two distinct conditions based on the age of the animal that is affected. Uh, the condition in young animals is less than 16 weeks of age is transmissible lymphoma and as we look at this particular animal you can see that there is a large mass which is the one of the mesenteric lymph nodes within the abdomen and a patterning to the liver which is a result of infiltration of large numbers of neoplastic lymphocytes which look something like this. Now um, when you more than, more than half of the uh, hamsters that, which are exposed to this virus when they're less than three weeks of age will develop lymphoma. And you can see the large number of lymphocytes which are infiltrating and, and replacing this liver. Okay, transmission appears to be direct from animal to animal and is passed in the urine and feces. Okay, and it was very common in this colony for over 25% of newly introduced hamsters to die of lymphoma by the age of 16 weeks. Now, when you have these young animals, you take the tumors out, they are non-productive, okay, meaning that they don't have detectable virus. So you have these tumors, everybody's dying, no detectable virus, the only way to get rid of it is to cull and slaughter. So that's what happens with this polyoma virus when young animals are infected. Now you can take the same virus, the same polyoma virus, and inf infect adult animals, and you get skin tumors. The skin tumors are trichoepitheliomas, 
look very much like a trichoepithelioma in most species with abortive multiple developing follicles. And this is what happens in the adult animals, and these are productive of virus. So the young animals, they die of lymphoma. You can't recover the virus. But if you inject into the old animals, they develop follicular tumors, which do, do produce virus. Okay, an odd thing, and the, the virus is not necessary for transmission. So that's how you're able to to pass this from young animal to young animal, young animal to old animal, because you could grind up the tumors, put it in there. But uh, a very interesting virus which, with two completely different diseases based on the animal that it was injected in. Here we have an old hamster with marked alopecia. Now there are a couple of possibilities here, okay. Hamsters and gerbils develop large numbers of uh, adrenocortical tumors, which can result in Cushing's disease and affect on the hair follicles. And then often complicating this are infections with demodectic mange. And this is a case of demodicosis in a Syrian hamster. Uh, everybody has the mites. We all have demodex mites, every dog, cat, whatever. It just depends on being immunosuppressed or old enough for the mice, uh, the mites to really establish a, a good population. In, there are two different types in the hamster, and they're also spread to, uh, you can find them in gerbils, sometimes in mice. Um, Demodex crisetti are stubby mites like this which live in epidermal pits. They don't live in follicles like we normally expect. They live in these little pits in the epidermic and they may not even be pathogenic. There is a longer mite, which looks very much like what we expect with, with uh, demodicosis in dogs. This is Demodex aurati, A-U-R-A-T-I, -A -T -I, and is a long parasite, and it lives in follicles. So this looks very much like Demodex image in other species. So that's demodicosis in hamsters. And if you do a biopsy, sometimes you'll also find um, these in the ostea of sebaceous glands. You can see them in sebaceous glands or in hair follicles and uh, can be a cause of hair loss in older animals. And one more picture, don't have a lot of, uh, of neoplasms in hamsters. We talked about adrenocortical carcinoma. Um, this is a Epitheliotropic lymphoma used to be called mycosis fungoides, but T-cell epitheliotropic lymphoma uh, is a much better name. It is a spontaneous lymphoma of older hamsters. It is not viral infected, and you can occasionally see this. So this is cutaneous T-cell epitheliotropic lymphoma. Okay, finally I want to spend just a little time. I don't have a lot to say about gerbils. But these are very interesting creatures, very friendly. Um, they are diurnal, which is nice if you're going to have them as a pet. And they have some very interesting anatomic features as well. Um, they probably have the shortest lifespan of circulating red blood cells of any species. It's only 10 days. And if you look at their, their blood, they have a, uh, it's very lymphocyte rich. They predominate uh, three or four to one over granulocytes. So uh, these are on standard guinea pig diet, excuse me, guinea pig, on standard diets, even the ones we feed them, they are normally lipemic, probably not in the wild, but we give them here as lipemic. So they are used heavily in research for, for cholesterol, and they become hypercholesterolemic if you give them just a couple of seeds in their diet. I don't know that much about gerbils. They do tend to come in all different colors. Um, the Mongolian gerbils are the most common type of gerbils that are used in research today, but occasionally you're going to hear uh, the names of other similar species being used in research like gerds or sand rats or antelope rats. Okay, nice animals, don't bite. Now here's an a, a interesting animal known as the fat sand rat or Somomus obesus. And it's, 
it's gaining popularity in research because it develops syndromes both of diabetes mellitus on normal rodent chow and also in the, uh, in the wild it lives on something called a salt bush. And without access to the salt bush, it will develop a syndrome of diabetes insipidus and gerbils, which are animals that live in extremely arid areas, have very highly developed water conservation functions. They have an extremely long renal pelvis, and they're used in research in uh, various you know, experiments which have to deal with normal function of the renal medulla. Okay, when, you know, they live in the desert so they can't afford to lose any, any water. You, when they urinate, it's, it's a little more like a puff of yellow dust than regular urine. We looked at the marking glands of hamsters, which are dorsal. In the gerbil, they are ventral and only seen in the male. Here's another one where female on the left, shaved abdomen, female on, or excuse me, male on the right, and you can see this long ventral marking gland, and when you look at it histologically, it is a modified sebaceous gland, uh, and there are some hair follicles in there, and essentially uh, it's just used for marking as opposed to hamsters where it has some, some role in conversion of testosterone. And it's also a site in the gerbil for cutaneous neoplasia, which we'll see in a minute. If you look at the adrenal glands of hamsters and, and especially gerbils, they have very large adrenal glands. It's about four times larger. And it's about you know, a quarter to a third the size of the size of the kidney. So it's much larger than what we would expect in other species. So don't mistake that as adrenal gland hyperplasia or hypertrophy. Uh, as opposed to guinea pigs, pups are not precocious. They are born hairless and blind, and their eyes don't open until about three weeks of age. Uh, and they can be weaned. The little guy on the bottom right is sort of cute. His eyes are open. He is now getting ready to go, and they are weaned at three weeks when their eyes open. Uh, Got to be careful with uh, gerbils. They do have a predilection when they are stressed to cannibalize their young. There are not a whole lot of, of well-documented diseases of gerbils. This is one um, that you will see. And you can see that there is hair loss on the nose. The nose is scabby. And there is a nice scab there. And this is a condition that is known among gerbil fanciers as sore nose or red nose. And realize that animals that live in very dry environments, um, they like to, they don't, have access to water, so they take what's known as sand baths, and that is uh, uh, that is required for you know their normal uh, normal grooming. And if they don't have access to sand and they can't groom, then they do secrete porphyrin pigments from the nasal lacrimal duct. And what these do, they accumulate, they run down to you know through the nasal lacrimal duct, and they accumulate on the nose, and they are very irritating to the nasal skin. The animal will scratch and they will have a secondary uh, infection with Staph aureus or maybe Staph xylosis as a sequel. And so this is sore nose or red nose. It is not a good idea to pick your gerbil up by the tail. You don't have to. They won't bite you um, because they will, it's known as tail slip and it is probably a uh, degloving injury, which is beneficial to the uh, uh, to the animal, because it's used to escape predators. No, the tail will not grow back. Well, these two little gerbils, which look like they're sleeping, aren't sleeping. Uh, Mongolian gerbils, up to about 40% of the uh, commonly used strains in the pet and laboratory trade. Uh, have epileptiform seizures, and they can be uh, they can be set off by large ambient noises. So you can walk up behind a gerbil and clap your hands loudly, and sometimes it will it will just uh, uh, go into this seizure activity. And and for this reason, they are sought of sought after 
by neurobiologists who are studying epilepsy. Uh, there are no described histologic lesions in these particular animals as, as you would probably expect. I really don't know what this slide means, but, uh, but it reminds me to tell you that uh, gerbils are used in stroke research. They have an incomplete circle of Willis. So if you, if you ligate the common carotid artery, you can result in cerebral ischemia and stroke. So they are also used in stroke research. We are looking at the ear pinna and the incised extra, uh, vertical ear canal of a hamster. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see a polyp and sort of a grainy keratinaceous uh, material deep to that. And this is a condition for which the gerbil is the human animal model for oral cholesteatomas. When I say oral cholesteatoma, it's A-U-R-A-L, meaning in the ear. And up to about 50% of gerbils over two years of age have this condition. And these are masses of keratinized epithelium which arise from the external surface of the eardrum and the surrounding external auditory canal. And when the, the uh, keratin that is produced, the compression on the eardrum can re result in the destruction of the temporal bone, the eardrum itself, and the inner ear structures. And this is generally what we see histologically and is just well, it's a cholesteatoma, so it is a granulomatous polyp or polyp with granulomatous inflammation and abundant free cholesterol, which takes the format, formation or the form of these acicular clefts. So this is the oral cholesteatoma, and then animals with oral cholesteatoma will characteristically have this type of head tilt. You may recognize this is the exact same picture that I used for the hamster when I was talking about uh, Tizzer's disease. And Mongolian gerbils are exquisitely susceptible to Tizzer's disease. They are often used as sentinels. So if someone wants to find out whether they have Clostridium proliformi in their research facility, they can collect uh, old and dirty litter and put gerbils in the room, and if there is Clostridium piliformi in the room, the gerbils will generally come down with it. They get the necrotizing uh, liver lesions and a silver stain, even a good gram stain, will demonstrate the presence of these haystacks or pickup stick formations of the very slender, long Clostridium piliformi, which fill the cytoplasm of borderline necrotic cells at the edge of these lesions. If you look in the center of the lesions, those cells are lice or the bacilli, you won't be able to see them. If you look in healthy cells, you probably won't see them. It's the ones right at the edge where you have the highest chance of seeing these organisms. They can be picked up if you have a high incidence of suspicion and really good eyes uh, on H&E, but a good gram stain or even better silver stain will give you an excellent uh, representation of the, these intracellular cytolytic bacteria. Uh, let's see, diarrhea. There are, of course, a number of conditions we've talked about that can cause that. In gerbils, one of the things that you do need to uh, uh, look for in your weanlings, and this is historical once again, uh, these are paratyphoid nodules associated with uh, salmonella. And so they are susceptible, as are hamsters and guinea pigs, to salmonella infections. Adults are generally pretty resistant to it, but weanlings, as we said before, are susceptible. This is the uh, armed rostellum on the left inside the scolex of Rodentolepis nana. In severely affected gerbils, rodentolepis nana can cause debilitation, but usually it is, as we saw in the hamster, an asymptomatic infection. 
and not of severe issues. This is a pinworm of the uh, gerbil and it really doesn't cause much of a problem either. Savatia alveolata has been uh, reported in gerbils, but this is a, a, uh, a worm known as dendra batitum, and these are the very uh, characteristic flattened eggs. So dendra batitum in the, uh, I just like the, the shape of the eggs. Don't really know that much about it, but the eggs are, they are pretty cool, aren't they? Old rodents, bad kidneys, okay. Chronic nephritis is common in, in old gerbils. You see marked thickening of the basement membrane. You can tell that this glomerulus is not functioning. Look at the protein casts, which are distending most of the surrounding tubules. Chronic interstitial nephritis, severe glomerular and tubular lesions in the gerbil. This is Demodex mite from the skin of a gerbil. Okay, this could be just as easily be Demodex orati from a hamster. Okay, Demodex is not a problem in healthy gerbils. If we do see it, it's going to be in older gerbils with concomitant health problems. We are looking at an older male gerbil and you can see that the area of the uh, ventral marking gland is swollen, hyperemic, and this is a neoplasm of the ventral marking gland, okay? And these are usually consistent with sebaceous carcinomas. Another common neoplasm of gerbils is a granulosa cell tumor. It looks very similar to what we see in other animal species, including the formation of rosettes, which in granulosa cell tumors are, result, are called call Exner bodies. Remember, granulosa cell tumors across the board, generally large cystic hemorrhagic neoplasms of the ovary. So this is a granulosa cell tumor. cross-section of the adrenal gland. As we saw in the hamster, adrenocortical adenomas, carcinomas are one of the more commonly recognized neoplasms in gerbils and in old animals can result in diffuse hair loss. And finally, cataracts. We can see them occasionally in hamsters and gerbils. There are no predispos predisposing causes so they appear to be spontaneous. And with that, I believe we are done. This was a nice little story about a guinea pig named Sooty who uh, escaped from his solitary confinement and tunneled into a cage of 24 females. Uh, he romanced each of them in turn and was yesterday the proud father of 43 offspring. So hats off to Sooty. And once again, I thank you for your attention.